In this lecture, you'll learn about load sharing mirrors, which provides load balancing and redundancy within the same cluster for NAS read-only volumes. Load sharing mirrors are mirror copies of FlexVol NAS volumes. They provide redundancy and load balancing within the same cluster. So they provide load balancing for read traffic only. Write requests always go to the single source volume to keep one consistent copy of the data. Load sharing mirrors are always in the same cluster as the source volume. They provide inter-cluster replication, not inter-cluster replication. So this is a difference between the data protection mirrors. Data protection mirrors can be within the same cluster or between different clusters, and they're most often between different clusters. But load sharing mirrors always within the same cluster. They are automatically mounted into the namespace with the same junction path as the source volume. So the load balancing and redundancy is provided automatically. Read requests will be serviced by the same node which the client connects to if that node has a load sharing mirror. If not, it will be serviced over the cluster interconnect. I'll explain that a bit further when we get to a diagram coming up. All read requests are directed to the load sharing mirror volumes, not the source volume. You should therefore also include a load sharing mirror on the same node where the source volume resides. So that's a little counterintuitive. You would think that you would want the destination volumes on the different nodes in the cluster, but you also want one on the same node as the source volume as well. So where the source volume is, you'll have the source volume and you'll have a destination volume on that same node. And again, the reason is because read requests always go to a load sharing mirror. So if a client connection does hit that node where the source volume is, you want a destination volume there so that it will also service the client read requests rather than that having to go over the cluster interconnect. To make write changes, clients must access the source volume by using the special dot admin path. Okay, so let's look and see how this works. So you can see in this diagram, each of these up at the top, let's say that's a single node. So I've got a four node cluster here. The green volume here is the source volume. That is the only writable copy. And then we create a load sharing destination mirror copy of that volume on each one of the nodes, including node three, which is where the source volume is. So let's say that the volume name is vol1. For clients to access vol1, they are going to map to slash vol1. Whenever they do that, if a client incoming connection gets load balanced over the network to node one, then that read, that read request will be serviced by the load sharing mirror on node one. If the read request hits node two, it will be serviced by the mirror on node two and also for node three and for node four. If, let's say that we only created three load sharing mirrors, which it is possible to do. Let's say we only created a load sharing mirror on nodes two, three, and four. Well, in that case, if a read request came in for vol one and it hit node one, that would have to be serviced by one of the other nodes over the cluster interconnect. And again, it would be serviced by the load sharing mirror. If a read request does hit node three, even though that is where the source volume is, it is going to be serviced by the load sharing mirror because it is a read request. If a write request comes in for the volume and to do that, the client has to connect to dot admin slash vol one. So when you're using load sharing mirrors, whenever anybody connects to the volume name, say vol one here, it's always going to default to being a read only access. For the client to be able to write changes to the source volume, they have to map a drive using a different path where they put dot admin before the actual volume name. So if a client does connect to this dot admin path, that will go to the source volume. If it hits a node other than node three in our example, it will go over the cluster interconnect to get to the source volume and it will be able to write changes there. So you can see from this, when using the normal volume name, it's always going to be read only. So load sharing mirrors are designed for volumes that are really read only volumes that are very rarely going to have any writes coming to them. 
Load sharing mirrors support SIFTS and NFS version 3 NAS protocols only. They do not support SAN protocol clients. NFS version 4 clients are compatible with load sharing mirror volumes. They'll always be directed to the source volume for both reads and writes rather than load balance to the local mirror copy for reads. So if the client is SIFTS or NFS version 3 and it sends in a read request for the volume, it's always going to hit the, lo the local load sharing mirror or go over the cluster interconnector if there isn't one on that node. But if it's an NFS version 4 client, whether it's a read or a write, it's always going to be directed to the source volume. So load sharing mirrors, they're compatible with NFS version 4, but they don't actually provide any benefit for NFS version 4 because clients are always going to use that one source volume. So because of this, don't configure load sharing mirrors for volumes hosting LUNs. It's not compatible with the SAN protocols. You can use load sharing mirrors on volumes that have a mix of both NFS version 3 and NFS version 4 clients. The NFS version 3 clients will get the benefits of the redundancy and the load balancing. The NFS version 4 clients will not. Don't configure load sharing mirrors on volumes with NFS version 4 clients only because you don't get any benefit from it. And all you're doing is creating mirrors on additional nodes, which is taking up disk space. So you're just wasting disk space for no benefit. Because load chaining mirrors are automatically mounted into the namespace with the same path as a source volume, they provide redundancy with no administrator intervention required. They work immediately as soon as you configure them, you don't have to do anything else. If the source volume becomes temporarily unavailable, read access to the volume is still provided through the load sharing mirror volumes. So if you didn't have load sharing mirrors, you just had that one copy of the source volume and you went down, obviously it wouldn't be available anymore. By having the load sharing mirrors, if the source volume does go down, clients still get access to that volume. Changes to the data will not be possible until the source volume comes back, back online in that case because it is the one writable copy. If the source volume is permanently unavailable, you can promote one of the load sharing mirror volumes to enable write access. So when you do a promote, the destination volume that you promote becomes the new source volume and it becomes the new one writable copy. So that uses the snap mirror promote command. It performs a failover of the source read write volume to a destination volume. It's specific to load sharing mirrors. We use different commands for our data protection mirrors. We'll get to those in a later lecture in this section. Changes to the destination volume, uh, changes the destination volume to the new source volume when you use that snap mirror promote command. The new source volume assumes the identity and load sharing mirror relationships of the original. So you don't need to set up the snap mirror replication again. That happens automatically when you use the snap mirror promote command. Client write accesses are redirected from the original source volume to the promoted destination volume and the original source volume is destroyed. So because the original source volume is destroyed, if that node is still there, you're going to want to create a new load sharing mirror destination to replace the one that was just promoted. Load sharing mirrors are useful for small volumes with frequently read but, infre but infrequently updated data, such as shared binary files or static websites. So with the load sharing mirrors, you're usually going to want to have one on each node in the cluster. So you don't want to use it for volumes that are large, that have got a lot of data there, because it would use up that amount of space on each node of the cluster. You probably don't want to use up that much disk space. So they're best for volumes that are small, where you don't mind having a copy of that volume on each node in the cluster. And because of the way that they work, for the read access, they're really designed for read-only volumes. Use them for volumes that have read-only. You can still make changes to those volumes by using that special .admin path, but this is something that you should not be doing frequently, so you're not going to have frequent writes to those volumes. Because they use asynchronous replication, they're not suitable for data that is frequently changed. Client read access can access out of date data between replications. So typically you're going to be using a one hour replication schedule here. So if you do make any changes, then when clients read the volume, it's going to take up to one hour before they see those changes. 
So really not used for volumes where you're writing data to those volumes. Okay, now let's talk about the SVM root volume. And the SVM root volume for NAS SVMs is by far the most common place to be using load sharing mirrors. And let's see why. So looking at SVM root volumes for SAN protocols first. SAN clients connect directly to LUNs. The client operating system maintains the index of file locations because we've got their own direct block access to the LUN. The SVM only serves as the container for the LUNs. SAN client connections, that's Fiber Channel, FCUE, iSCSI, do not depend on the SVM root volume. So what this means is if you've got an SVM, you're always going to have the root volume for that SVM, whether it's serving NAS or SAN protocols or both. Say that we've got an SVM, it's got its root volume there, and then in that SVM we've got a vol, vol1, and there's a LUN in vol1. Well, if the root volume of the SVM goes down, the client can still access its LUN. It does not depend on the root volume being up to be able to access its LUN. It's different for NAS protocols, so with NAS protocols, the clients connect to the SVM namespace and the SVM root volume serves as the root of the namespace and it maintains a file index for all the NAS data volumes in the SVM. The index is checked when a client accesses data. So using the same example again, but for NAS now, if we've got a NAS SVM, we've got the root volume there and we've got vol1 in that SVM. Well, if the root volume goes down, even if vol1 is still up, clients are not going to be able to make new connections to vol1. For your NAS protocols, to, for clients to access any volume in the entire SVM, the root volume needs to be available. So it's really important that the root volume is always accessible for our NAS protocols. So again, if the node hosting an SVM root volume goes down, the NAS clients lose access to all volumes in the SVM, not just the root volume. So for that reason, it's best practice to create a load sharing mirror for each NAS SVM root volume on each node of the cluster. That gives you the redundancy. It also provides load balancing for the access as well. You should not store user data in the root volume of an SVM because you're going to have load sharing mirrors there. You're going to have a load sharing mirror on each node in the cluster. So you don't want data in that root volume with the load sharing mirrors taking up space on all of your different nodes. So the root volume of an SVM should always be empty. You're going to have other volumes hanging off of the root volume, which are going to be used for your actual client data. The root volume of the SVM should be used as the entry to the namespace for junction paths only. User data should be stored in non-root volumes hanging off of the root volume. Okay, last thing, a one hour replication schedule is recommended for SVM root volumes. There's no data in there, there's never any writes, so they're not changing, so you do not need a frequent schedule. One hour is fine. Client connections are going to be routed to the load sharing mirrors rather than the source volume first, as we explained earlier. And to ensure a direct path is used, create a load sharing mirror on every node, including the node where the source volume is located. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.